So guys, today we need to talk. And I mean really talk. Let's talk about an ugly truth in the VR sphere that nobody really wants to touch. Today, let's talk about why this game and to a lesser extent this game are the worst things that could have happened for the immediate future of VR gaming. Welcome to the simulation inside the simulation. I am Too Damn Golden, your VR Voyager, and today we're gonna get real about VR's most critically acclaimed game, Half-Life Alex, and I'm gonna provide a couple of reasons why its release has perhaps set VR gaming back a decade. Now, on a surface level, it may seem a little far-fetched to say that a game as universally acclaimed as this, can be a hindrance to anything. In fact, if anything, a high caliber console seller is exactly what VR needs. Think the original Xbox and Halo, the NES and Super Mario Bros, or even a handheld console like the Game Boy and Pokemon. Typically speaking, titles like these absolutely drive up the sales of the affiliated consoles and lead to wider adoption of said platform. However, with VR, something, no, everything is different. You see, with VR, you not only have to sell consumers on the idea of forking over between $400 and $1,200 on a new console itself without even factoring in the cost of a VR capable PC if you choose to forego the standalone route, but you also have to sell the idea of wearing a cumbersome accessory on your face to play the game with to begin with and throw things like motion sickness, potential cable management, and lack of viable amount of space to comfortably and safely enjoy your VR experience into the mix. And you've built yourself a pretty high barrier of entry for the already select group of individuals that want to play VR gaming at its fullest potential. Thus, making the issue of onboarding VR adopters a multifaceted one, one of which is gonna take a lot more than a singular blockbuster title to change, which leads me to reason number one why Half-Life Alex may have actually been a hindrance to the immediate future of VR gaming. Expectations. It set the expectation of what the current state of VR gaming is to most people entirely too high. Now, let's be clear. Half-Life Alex is a good game. A really, really good game. A really, really, really good game in a beloved franchise by an established developer who clearly put the time, money, effort, and resources into creating a well thought out and polished built from the ground up VR game. And the truth is, it did exactly what Valve intended it to do. It sold Valve indexes. In fact, Valve saw the indexes sales jump from 46,000 during quarters one through three in 2020 to a whopping 149,000 for the entire year with quarter four seeing 103,000 of those sales happening directly after the announcement of Half-Life Alex, which is why the 2.3 million copies sold of this critically acclaimed title aren't surprising at all, as these figures don't even count the folks who bought another headset such as the Quest 2 uh, in combination with Oculus Link or Virtual Desk desktop for the sole purpose of playing Half-Life Alex. But unfortunately, the real issues for the VR world begins once the gamer has finished completing Half-Life Alex itself. You see, with Half-Life Alex being the main reason that a large chunk of people jumped into VR gaming in the first place, actually doing the rarest thing in all of gaming today, you know, actually living up to its pre-release hype, the influx of new VR gamers that have now seen the highest of highs that VR gaming has to offer, excited by a juggernaut of a VR experience, begin to look for other AAA experiences to explore, when suddenly the reality of the situation begins to become much more bleak. Because outside of Half-Life Alex and the Sanzaru games develop Asgard's Wrath, there really aren't many full-length AAA VR games. Sure, you can jump into Skyrim VR with mods and tons and tons of these mods, of course, or even something more current like Resident Evil 7 for the PlayStation VR, but those are ported experiences that technically you can play elsewhere in Pancake Land. So now you have the issue that this large flow of people who are excited about the burgeoning technology of VR gaming are left in the dark searching for the next Half-Life Alex out there, when in reality, another Half-Life Alex doesn't yet exist. So unfortunately, Half-Life Alex to me suffers from the same issue that the Google Glass did way back in 2013. It is simply ahead of its time and the rest of technology needs the time to catch up. 
And let's make this clear, this is not due to lack of effort from these other VR developers. The fact of the matter is, none of these other developers possess the budget that Valve possesses, simple as that. So as a result of this, what we end up with is a large chunk of the player base disinterested in VR gaming due to the expectations being that of Half-Life Alex. when in reality, most games are more in line with the Green Hell VR or Blade and Sorcery, or even if you're looking at the top end of VR gaming, Boneworks, Red Matter 2, and even the Walking Dead Saints and Sinners most definitely are not Half-Life Alex nor Asgard's Wrath in terms of depth. Thus, creating a situation where the narrative of VR having no games goes around, which of course we've already began the process of debunking with my last video, which I will leave a link for on the screen now. Sorry about the shameless plug, but essentially you get a player base that feels cheated when the stark reality of things is simply that the cost of producing a triple A VR title is a guaranteed financial loss and 99% of VR studios cannot afford to take the loss. Finances the finances. Guys, there is a reason that most VR games aren't as polished as Half-Life Alex or Asgard's Wrath. Most VR studios are currently smaller scale indie studios and titles of that scope take time and money. Let's take Asgard's Wrath for example, a title that had a team of 90 developers backed by Meta's millions and took three and a half years to develop. Now the end result? Asgard's Wrath still stands as one of VR's highest rated games almost four years post release. Now let's look at the main game of today's video, Half-Life Alex, which has had Valve's massive backing, in fact the largest in Valve's history uh, in terms of developers, with over 80 developers working on this project, and an extended four and a half year development cycle which culminated in the masterpiece of an experience that many gamers know and love today as Half-Life Alex. But for most studios, time and money aren't a luxury that they possess in the sense that while Meta funded Sanzaro and Valve can withstand the financial losses associated with large-scale AAA development, most VR studios cannot and are looking to turn a profit on their passion projects in order to fund their larger VR ambitions, which honestly is the other major reason why Half-Life Alex has potentially done more harm than good for VR gaming and that it showed other larger developers that you can put all the love, care, and effort that you want into a VR project and even if it sells well by VR standards, which it very much by all accounts did, that given the high cost of development and small user base in VR right now, that Honestly, taking the hit with the loss leader title isn't the most financially viable for most companies at the moment. Even more so when you consider the current loss leaders like Half-Life Alex, Asgard's Wrath, or even Beat Saber are being funded by corporations that have a dog in the fight in terms of VR hardware, whereas most developers simply do not. It is not financially viable to pour tens of millions of dollars into games that truthfully, not many people will play. I mean, critical and community acclaim aside, Half-Life Alex has only ever hit an all-time concurrent player count on Steam of 16 1,459 players with an average of 672 players at any given time in the last 30 days, as opposed to the 32,635 all-time high player count of the 2020 Resident Evil 3 remake, of which still averaged 696 players at any given time, or 24 more than oh VR's most critically acclaimed game. Now, I chose this game as a comparison for a few reasons. First of all, they are both single-player story-driven experiences that are similar genre-wise, both releasing around the same general time frame. Now, with the Resident Evil 3 remake releasing on multiple platforms and PC easily being its least popular, uh, it does give us an opportunity to see what these gaming studios see market-wise. VR's best-rated game with massive love from the gamers themselves as of January 25th, 2020. 2023 has a slightly lower impact on the gaming world than a remake of a 24 year old game that itself garnered mixed to slightly above average reviews and again we're comparing this solely to its pc statistics that are invariably its lowest when compared to its council counterparts switch excluded of course now why would i as a money-driven gaming conglomerate invest money into a perceived fringe technology when i can easily turn out an average hell even garbage title and still earn more revenue by slapping a ton of microtransactions on actual trash. Ultimately, it's the smaller developers who actually care about the technology itself that end up getting hurt in the end because when you have a market that expects every single title 
uh, and VR to be a Half-Life Alex uh, or an Asgard's Wrath. Even amazing VR experiences like Echo Arena or Super Hot VR end up feeling cheap and the community feels cheated, thus creating negative word of mouth around the VR technology as a whole. Or in another lose-lose situation for the indie developers, they are forced to prolong development cycles, costing them more resources that they really don't have the access to to begin with, and with much smaller teams than AAA studios, thus creating a situation where the entirety of their company's existence potentially hinges on the success of one singular game in a still developing market. An undoubtedly stressful situation for what should be projects of joy, love, and passion at this particular particular stage in this particular technology. VR gaming needed the time to develop an arsenal of fully fleshed out full length games via smaller studios for at least the next five to seven years before a colossal title like Half-Life Alex or even Asgard's Wrath disrupted the conversation so that after the gamer was done with those titles, they felt that they had a wide variety of that same quality of game to fall back on. Because while having a console seller is great in theory, you have to remember that within the realm of virtual reality that you aren't just selling a console, you are selling a new technology. So now VR is in a weird place where the bigger upcoming titles like Skydance Interactive's Behemoth have to be absolute hits and smaller indie studios simultaneously have to massively up their quality with tight budgets, all because of the expectations of the VR community set due to Half-Life Alex being way too early to the VR party. So that just about wraps up today's video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. If you did, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Um, let me know in the comments below, do you guys agree with me or do you think I'm overreacting? Uh, is Half-Life Alex's polish uh, something that has negatively impacted the current state of VR development? I have brand new videos coming at you guys every Monday and Friday, so make sure you're subscribed for that. Uh, pretty much, thank you so much for watching, guys. I am to damn golden your vr voyager and thank you for joining me in the simulation inside simulation